The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Four years ago, you might remember the, the uh, speech that President Obama gave in Cairo where he set out to uh, begin anew in this relationship that the West had, that the United States had with, uh, with Islam. And it was after that speech, we had a lot to say about it at thetrumpet.com, as you might remember. Uh, but it was after that speech, uh, a speech in which he uh, defended, really, Iran's right to pursue nuclear weapons and really tried to praise Islam and their contribution to society. It was after that speech that uh, my father wrote this for the, the website, and this appeared later in the magazine, the Trumpet magazine. He said, President Obama thinks that through his words he will uh, have peace with Iran, but after the terrorists heard that speech, they had to be rejoicing. When America's president gives a speech like that, he said, the terrorists have contempt for such weakness and are stirred to fight even harder. They can smell the victory. So, he concluded, we can expect violent terrorism to intensify and shake the nations. And then he said, we won't have long to wait to see who is right. Whether it was the, the pundits back then who tried to tell us that there really was no concern that the Muslim Brotherhood was rising in Egypt and that radical Islam was rising elsewhere, or whether it was the trumpet that was right. Now, you move forward four years to where we are today, and you see the Middle East uh, is in flames. I mean, it's burning in so many nations. Right there in Egypt, uh, to take one example, there's others, but in Egypt, as you've probably seen here recently, um, the undemocratic, anti-Christian regime, known as the Muslim Brotherhood, they were ousted uh, back in July by the Egyptian military that had just had enough. I mean, that had gone on for over a year. They were persecuting Christians. Radicalism was spreading. And so the military rose up and said, that's enough. And they put Morsi under arrest and took over the country. And since that time, of course, the, uh, the nation of Egypt, uh, which is the most populous uh, Arabic nation in the Middle East, it's just been in turmoil particularly over the last week, as you've seen the Muslim Brotherhood rise up and uh, basically start a civil war. Now, it's interesting when you watch what's happening geopolitically, because uh, the military did, you know, come down hard on the Islamists last week, and this led to an outcry in some circles, but at the same time, you have nations like Saudi Arabia and Israel, who are right there in the neighborhood, who are pleading with the military to crush the brotherhood. They're pleading with them to take care of this problem. It's like a cancer, and they want to see it uprooted. They want to see it torn out. They want to see a return to the status quo, like it was under Mubarak, who was a dictator, but who kept the forces of radical Islam in check. And he did so for a period of decades. Now, while you have Saudi Arabia and Israel pleading for uh, the military to come on strong, you have the United States, on the other hand, who's sided with the Muslim Brotherhood. The administration that's currently in Washington has a lot invested in its support for the Muslim Brotherhood, which makes no bones about its, <laughs> its true uh, feelings and intentions regarding the United States. We're seen as an enemy in that camp, and yet the United States is there backing and supporting this organization even as they roam the countryside and destroy Christian churches. All these Coptic churches that you've probably heard of, I think now over 50 that have been burned and looted by terrorists, the ones that the army is trying to put down. They're destroying these churches throughout the nation. There was uh, one story in an Israeli paper uh, just a few days ago that said that this past Sunday was the first Sunday in 1600 years that the Coptic churches in the northern uh, part of the nation had canceled mass. I mean, these Christians are on the run. 
the churches have been branded physically. They've been marked for these roaming mobs to destroy. This is happening in, uh, in Egypt on Monday uh, in the Sinai. These terrorists uh, ambushed a convoy that was carrying quite a few uh, policemen, 25, and they pulled them out of the convoy, set them in front of the firing squad, and executed all of them, all 25 of them. This is from the Associated Press. It says, the militants forced the two vehicles to stop, ordered the policemen out, and forced them to lie on the ground before they shot them to death, the official said. The killings took place near the border town of Rafa. If you look at a map, of course, Rafa is right there next to Israel. That's the border between Sinai and, and uh, Israel. It says here, the uh, Sinai has been witnessing almost daily attacks targeting security forces by suspected militants since uh, the July 3rd ouster of Islamist President Mohammed Morsi. So, irrespective of what you might see or read in the news, the Muslim Brotherhood is not going to go away. <laughs> it's not going to go away. The military may uh, gain a, an upper hand here, despite the United States' best efforts to try to prevent that. But even if it does, you go back to the statistics that we've quoted to you before about the sentiment in Egypt and how many Islamist sympathizers there are and how many people who are, who are committed supporters of the Brotherhood there are in that nation. They're not going to go away. And as strong as the showing of force has been in the past week, it was stronger under Mubarak. Now the military evidently is trying to, you know, give him back his freedom, and they've, I guess, they've captured and arrested the spiritual leader of the, uh, the Brotherhood. So you can get a sense of what the military wants. They want it to just go back to what it was before the so-called Arab Spring, because they know it's been a nightmare for the Egyptian people. They know this. They're on the ground. They see it. They see what Morsi was doing. But here in the States, of course, we can't see it. It's not talked about, not like it should be. And the administration, of course, just turns a blind eye to all this persecution against Christians. Not one word is said about it. It's astonishing. Nothing is said. This is from a, a column written by Ralph Peters. The Brotherhood protesters rejected all offers of compromise and all demands to disperse. The interim government's response was heavy-handed, but the Muslim Brotherhood chose violent resistance. They chose it, using women and children as shields, a tactic typical of Islamist terrorists. And yet you hear anyone speaking for the White House or the State Department, and they will not tell you this. They just tell you that the, the protesting was so, supposedly peaceful. Even as churches are burning, <laughs> Christian churches are burning. Peters went on to say, do, do we really need to have sympathy for the devil with its blundering, fickle, late in the day support for whoever appeared to be gaining the upper hand? The Obama administration has managed the remarkable feat of alienating every faction in Egypt, and it's a sorry day when an American administration abets religious totalitarianism, as this White House did when the democratically elected Morsi regime tried to Islamize Egypt's government and society for keeps. That's what was happening, which is why the military put its foot down. He says, there was indeed a coup, but not all coups involved tanks. The real coup came after Egypt's premature, badly flawed election, when Morsi and the Brotherhood excluded all non-brothers from the political process, curtailed media freedoms, and jailed journalists, attacked Christians, and rushed toward an Islamist state that the majority of Egyptians did not want. Well, we might take exception with that last statement. I think uh, a majority of Egyptians rather want this. Many don't. But really, the, the, the astonishing part of this story is that the United States wants this. The United States wants is an, an Islamist state in Egypt. That's the, the stunning angle of this story. And so the military did crack down hard, but the blood that's currently flowing in Egypt, that's on the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's on the Brotherhood, what we now see happening. And you can see their true intentions, as I said, as those, uh, those terrorist mobs ransack these churches throughout Egypt. It's been the way of the Brotherhood since 1981, when they murdered Anwar Sadat. Remember him, he's the one that risked his life to make peace with Israel. And it was the Brotherhood who killed him. 
It's the brotherhood that spawned all of these terrorist organizations, these terrorist offshoots around the world, like Al-Qaeda. That's where their roots go back to. On Monday, Egypt's uh, military, as I said, arrested the, the spiritual leader, Muhammad Badi, who uh, heads up, or at least spiritually, the, the brotherhood. Um, and they've been talking recently about dissolving the brotherhood or banning the brotherhood. It was interesting following on some of that uh, speculation um, what one representative of the State Department said. The State Department here in the United States who was asked, you know, have you heard these reports about the Brotherhood uh, being banished uh, from Egypt, at least as a political organization? And the spokesman said, we believe any process moving forward needs to be inclusive and include all parties and all sides. In other words, we don't want the Brotherhood to be banned. We'd rather have them have a strong say in whatever, govern whatever the government that's formed next. <clears throat> that's America. That's America's position. This is a quote from uh, Powerline, the blog, which uh, wrote that Jimmy Carter infamously declared that America suffered from an inordinate fear of communism, but at least as far as I can recall, he didn't actively promote or side with communist uh, movements. Today, he said, communism has collapsed and America's number one enemy is the Mus Muslim Brotherhood, the progenitor of Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and other terrorist groups. He says, finally, Barack Obama not only tolerates the Brotherhood, it says later, but for reasons that remain unfathomable, he has generally supported it. You just really can't explain it. It's hard to explain from someone who sees what's happening, a realist who sees what's happening in the region, which is now exploding with violence. Look at Syria as the civil war continues in that nation just north of Israel, over 100,000 people have now been slaughtered in the last couple years. It's a brutal, brutal civil war. And there's been a documented use now of chemical weapons. Syria has the largest stockpile of chemical uh, weapons in the region. I mean, it's a powder keg waiting to explode. This is not some small problem that you can just sweep right under the rug. You have a, an authoritarian regime trying to maintain hold on its power. And then you have these rebel forces that have, once again, been infiltrated by terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda and the like. And that, as it happens, uh, is the group we're supporting, or we want to support. You have congressmen on the left and on the right, two stars in the Republican Party, who are over there taking pictures with uh, people that are associated with Al-Qaeda, or going to Egypt and sitting down with the Muslim Brotherhood. They want to arm the rebels in Syria these rebels that are associated with Al-Qaeda, which is exactly what we did in Libya. And look at how that turned out for us. It's as if America hasn't learned one thing from even mistakes that happened 18 months ago. It's a real shame to see what's happening. We want to arm Al-Qaeda, the people that want to kill us. This, as I say, is not the kind of problem that you can just sweep away and hope that it never returns. It's not going to go away quietly, Syria. Neither will the Brotherhood. And meanwhile, you have looming large behind the scenes, you have Iran, which probably, <laughs> you have to think that they're just ecstatic to see all these distractions, to see all this attention being given to Egypt, all of this attention being given to Syria, and the nuclear weapons program just continues right on. Again, with America's tacit support, Oh, we've got a new one, a new president in Iran, and he's a moderate, we've been told. But he's not a moderate. There's nothing moderate uh, about him, as the president or the prime minister of Israel has been pleading <laughs> with Western officials and journalists, saying, look, take note, not of what this man says, but look at the actions. Look at what he's doing. Look at what Iran continues to do. They've already taken over Iraq, thanks to America's departure, they control Iraqi airspace. There's Iranian officials uh, searching for those in Iraq that were helping America when we were there so they can kill them. They've taken over. They're, they're behind Assad in Syria. I mean, there's some major, major power plays going on. 
And everywhere you look, you either see America in retreat or you see America siding with the enemy. It truly is an upside-down world, just as uh, Isaiah describes in chapter 3. What is it that's our primary concern? When you just look at the whole region and you think about America's foreign policy, as confused as it is and disorganized and, you know, it's like a split personality in some ways, double speak, you know, speaking out of both sides of our mouth in Egypt or Syria or wherever. And yet, generally speaking, what's been the most pressing concern for U.S. officials with respect to the Middle East? Well, it's Israel, you see, the Israel-Palestinian conflict. We have to solve that one. We have to somehow get peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And if you've noticed anything about Egypt, to take that first example, or Syria, Israel's had nothing to do with these conflicts. These are brutal Arab or Islamic on Islamic violence. And Israel's just there. I mean, I'm not saying Israel isn't nervous or ever watchful of what's happening in its neighborhood. But certainly Israel's not the cause. And yet you look at so many people in Washington, and particularly on the left, and it's as if Israel is the problem. Why? Well, because Israel's the one that has to make concessions. Israel was just pressured by the United States to release 104 terrorists. One of them actually killed an American. And our administration wants us to let those terrorists go. Why? So that the Arabs will sit down and talk with Israel. They had to release, think about this for a second, they had to release 104 terrorists, hardened criminals, murderers, just to have the privilege of being able to sit at a table with Mahmoud Abbas. That's it. No concessions on the side of the Palestinians or Ramallah, or the PLO, the the Palestinian Authority, I should say. No concessions. Just to be able to sit at a table with someone that won't even accept you as a state. Daniel chapter 11, let's just look at a few verses we've read. Probably just about more than any other verses in (laughs) these forums. Daniel chapter 11 an upside-down world. You look at the liberal mindset in Washington, and it's, it's scary what these fantasists think that making concessions or appeasing the enemy, giving up terrorists, and we're handing over some, even as other prisons are, you know, breaking open and terrorists are flooding into the streets from prison breaks. It's a frightening world. I mean, if we didn't know what we know, as far as Bible prophecy goes, what would we think? I mean, where, where is there hope in a world like the one that we see today in most schools, probably about every college in the United States? You're not gonna hear much of anything about what's happening in the Middle East. All of our top officials get back from their, you know, their nice summer breaks, and the first thing we hear about is, well, we've got to fix the national health care system, as if that's the only thing that matters in this world, getting nationalized health care. Verse 40 of Daniel 11, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So here is this coming clash between the king of the north, the European beast power, and the king of the south, which is radical Islam headed by Iran, okay? We know that that's coming. We can see it already. Iran's policy has been to provoke, to push, to push. It's been patient in its pushing. It inches forward in some cases. But there's this constant pushing and pushing and pushing that's going on. And for the most part, the United States has been pushed out of the region. And so what it's leading to is this push up against Europe. What do you think the Vatican is thinking right now as it sees all these Coptic churches burning in Egypt? Do you think they're going to just sit back and let this sweep across the region? Do we know anything about history? Over the Middle Ages, the Crusades? Christians against the the nation of Islam or the people of Islam? 
that's coming again. That's really what this is talking about. That's the kind of clash it is. It's a religious clash. It's the forces of radical Islam clashing against the European power that's straddled by that woman we read about in the book of Revelation, which is a type, of course, of, of a church. Mr. Fraser posted an article at the uh, trumpet.com on August 16th, just speaking of Washington's policies of appeasement and what cost there's been because of it. He says, the cost of the president's policy of appeasing all who hate America, keep in mind, again, that Cairo speech. This was the speech that was supposed to begin the process of fixing all that was wrong between America and radical Islam. He says, uh, the cost of the president's policy of appeasing all who hate America has escalated dramatically since we turned tail and ran from our Middle Eastern, North African, and Pakistani embassies just over a week ago based on the mere shadow of an unidentified threat of, a, of attack. You heard about that in the news as well. We shut down 20 embassies in nations because of a threat of attack. And this is not less than a year after we talked about Al-Qaeda being on the run. Osama bin Laden's dead. That was what was on the campaign trail all last year. But it's America who's running. It's America who's fleeing. It's America who's gone from Iraq, soon Afghanistan. All these embassies. We've got to wake up and see what's happening here. Because these are prophecies being fulfilled. In the wake of this latest uh, diplomatic debacle, the current U.S. presidency risks overseeing the greatest elevation of international hatred for America since the United States became a sovereign nation. The hatred has intensified. The violence has increased. The Middle East is in flames. What did my father say in that 2009 article? We're not going to have to wait very long to figure out who's right here, whether it's the pundits or whether it's the trumpet. And isn't that the case today? Isn't that the truth? Just a few years later, and the whole region basically has been transformed as radical Islam has swept across the territory. Verse 41, here in Daniel, he shall enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So Egypt's going to be allied with this king of the south. That's how we know the Muslim Brotherhood's not going to go away quietly. They're going to come back. It may be this week, it may be next month, it may be next year, who knows. They've been patient all these years, all these decades, waiting and waiting and waiting on Mubarak to be removed. And finally he was. And then they tasted, they tasted the power of being at the top. They had it for over a year, and now they're not going to wait patiently anymore. They're going to go after it. They're not going to go away. Verse 43, it talks about Libya and the Ethiopians. It's interesting if you go back and look at what uh, everyone was writing in the news media in 2011 when the Arab Spring was off and running. You know, there was Tunisia, that sort of set off the fire. Then Egypt, I mean, that just exploded things. And then everybody said, well, oh, it's Yemen. Yemen is next, and Yemen must be about to fall. The little nation of Yemen. And it was the church, this church, this school, the trumpet that was talking about Libya. And then Ethiopia. That'll happen soon enough. It's already happening. But who else was talking about Libya as soon as the Arab Spring kicked off? It was this organization, and right after that, we started arming the rebels, Al-Qaeda and the like, in Libya. Gaddafi was overthrown. The Islamists gained control. Forget about the figurehead that's at the top. Who's running the country? We learned a lot about that uh, the night of the tragedy in Benghazi last year. How much? My father wrote back after that Cairo speech, how much did America's president help the terrorist cause? He said probably far more than we imagined. That speech in Cairo, if you remember, the Muslim Brotherhood was in attendance, not Mubarak. Mubarak was still in charge. He was still the president. He wasn't invited. The Brotherhood was. And then my father said, how much did America's president help the terrorist cause? Probably far more than we imagine. Isn't that the truth? 
toward the end of that article, he uh, talked about the impact that this speech, the Cairo speech, would have on the flow of prophetic events. He said, President Obama's speech is a great turning point in the world. It's going to play a major role in terrifying prophecies of your Bible being fulfilled. And today, what do we see? We see the Middle East on fire. We see Al-Qaeda and all of its affiliates now gaining ground. Al-Qaeda and its allies covers more geographical territory than it did in, in 9-11, the first 9-11. I'm talking 2001. It's bigger, it's stronger than it was then. But you'd never know it if you were watching the mainstream news today. Well, just back in April, we had two sympathizers, Al-Qaeda sympathizers, who pretty much shut down the city of Boston for the better part of a week. They're gaining in strength. You've had all these massive jailbreaks. You've had U.S. embassies around the region closed. Unprecedented. I mean, when has the United States turned tail and run out of 20 embassies? Well, just a couple of weeks ago. Luke 21, let's just conclude over here. Luke 21, after 12 years in the war against terrorism, what does the United States have to show for it, students? And a follow-up question to that would be, who told you at the outset of the war against terrorism how this was going to turn out for the United States? <laughs> That would be the trumpet. That would be the trumpet. Prophecy is being fulfilled. The pride in America's power has been broken. Luke 21 and verse 34, it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that that day come upon you unawares. It's happening all so fast, I mean, incredibly fast. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's coming like a snare, like a trap. And honestly, there's not very many people in America, certainly not on college campuses today, that are prepared for what's coming. Are you ready for what's coming on this earth? Are you prepared? Jesus Christ urged us to be ready, to not get caught up into the things of this world that distract us, that get us to bury our heads in the sand. Christ said, you wake up when you see these things happening. He gave us some very, some very clear, inspired advice and admonition. He said in verse 36, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch world events. We're commanded to do so. And as you do, students, don't forget to pray, to pray always for God's kingdom to be set up on this earth and for us to be able to escape what's coming. 